Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming on the first day. I'm kind of amazed and proud of UCSD for the turnout on the first day of classes. Uh, maybe I should check on the last day of classes and see how many people are here. Uh, we should we'll run some kind of comparison. Uh, yeah, we're, so uh, I'm pretty punctual, as are all of you. So we're going to end right at 5 o'clock. I think Jason can always linger around if there's some kind of unanswered question, but I think we'll be sure to have everybody on their way uh, to other activities at 5 o'clock. So right, I kind of the script. Welcome to the public lecture hosted by the 21st Century China Center at UCSD's School of Global Policy and Strategy. In fact, this is one of our fall series. We have an exciting lineup ahead, beginning with Jason Kelly's insightful. How did they know it's insightful yet? I don't, I don't <laughs> know. <laughs> Probably insightful based on his book presentation today. In October, we'll delve into how four uh, sovereign funds have contributed to China's ascension, followed by the China Town Hall featuring U.S. Ambassador to China Nicholas Burns in a telecast with our own Professor Michael Davidson, who will deliver a talk in person. Lastly, don't miss the third Zhou Wen Zhong Distinguished Lecture on Chinese Culture showcasing Wu Man, the world's foremost pipa virtuoso and prominent advocate of Chinese music. Wow, I didn't know about this stuff, so I'm glad I read it. Very interesting. Uh, about the 21st century uh, center, I guess it's the beginning of the year, so it is kind of worth reminding ourselves what, what's going on here. The 21st Century China Center is a research center and think tank based here at UCSD School of Global Policy and Strategy. The center's primary focus is on conducting cutting edge research engaging with business and policymakers and fostering educational exchange. With a strong foundation in research and prominent presence in foreign policy discussions beyond academia, the center plays a critical role in promoting informed dialogue and shaping the relationship between the United States and China. Today's lecture is in hybrid mode, so we have an audience uh, somewhere lurking out there in the internet. Uh, I'm Carl Gerth. Good thing this is written down for me. Uh, i and Julia Show, professor of, of what am I a professor? Suddenly disappears here of history here at UCSD. Um, Jason Kelly, our speaker today, is a senior lecturer in the Department of Politics and International Relations at Cardiff University and associate in research. Are you still an associate in research at the Fairbanks Center? I am. Yeah. Excellent. Mm -hmm. At uh, the Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies at Harvard University. Trained as an historian of modern China, he was previously a foreign service officer in the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. China, I'm not sure I keep going on to that. I think they just need to show the important item here, which is oh, Jason. Nice. I don't even have a copy of it with me. Huh? Oh, okay. Here, I'll let you wave around and uh, point to it. Uh, Jason is the author of uh, this well-received study, Market Maoist, which shows the seeming paradox uh, between a capitalist state led by a communist party is nothing new. Uh, it goes on to describe a little bit of this, but since his talk it is largely... You can steal my thunder. I don't yes. want to steal your right. thunder, Thank and you. I'll just... Uh, turn it over to you. So how long were you told to speak for? Uh, they said shoot for about 30 minutes. 30 minutes, think, okay, maybe. 30 minutes, and then we'll have the rest of the hour for your Q&A, so. Yeah, great, you, okay, all right. Well, thank you very much, um, Carl, for the introduction. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thanks also, before I forget, to uh, Sherry, who, and Susan Zhao for all the logistics that helped me get here from Wales, where I now teach. Uh, and thanks, just as importantly, to the 21st Century China Center for having me. Um, but extra thank you to you all for coming out today. I understand this is the very first day of classes, so I'm just thrilled that this many people are interested uh, in coming to hear more about trade and diplomacy in Mao's China, which is obviously a subject near and dear to my heart. So today, what I'm going to do is talk about, as, as Professor Gert mentioned, my book, which came out with Harvard University Press. It's called Market Maoist, Communist Origins of China's Capitalist Ascent. And uh, for those who haven't read it, uh, just a very, very brief capsule summary of it. What it does is it traces the commercial relationships between Mao's China, on the one hand, the Chinese Communist Party specifically, and capitalists all around the world, different firms, governments, individual traders uh, from the late 1930s. So it starts at the beginning of the Second Sino-Japanese War, war in the Pacific. And then it traces the evolution of these 
relationships over the years up through the Civil War into the founding of the new Chinese Communist State in 1949, and then throughout the first couple of decades of state building and the creation of Mao's China. And it concludes in the early 1970s. So those of you who know about, you know, which I suspect many people in the room do, the, the general way we think about uh, Chinese foreign policy in the Mao era, it's distinctly different from what came after an opening reform in the late 1970s and the early 1980s. So the book is showing that actually the story is much more complicated than that. And I'll talk about that today. Uh, in my 30 minutes, I don't have time to cover every detail in the book. So what I'll do is just give you sort of a sampler and I'll talk about some of the themes and some of the big issues that, uh, that emerged from my research. And I also wanna to touch at the very end a little bit on why it matters today. So I understand we're not all historians, can't all be historians, uh, but this history, I do think, is really important for understanding what's going on in China uh, today and for understanding China more broadly and the world. So that's that's the plan for today. Uh, before I launch into that, though, I want to talk a little bit about how the project started. So I'm someone who's always interested. I always want to know how people get into some of these seemingly obscure issues that they research. Um, and so I thought I'd talk a little bit about that. This project started with me digging through old volumes of trade statistics, which is as exciting as it sounds. There's a lot of tables, dry, dusty tables that showed a surprising, to me at the time, a surprising amount of trade between Mao's China and various Japanese countries, right? So hundreds of millions of dollars a year, year after year, throughout the 1950s and the 1950s. So there is a lot, there were a lot of statistics, trade figures were abundantly available and there was some good work by economists who were trying to figure out at the time and in later years, just the full scale and scope of this trade. But there wasn't really much information about the individual figures behind the statistical figures, right? And that's what I really became interested in uh, at the outset. So who, who were the people who sat down in Mao's China as representatives of this new socialist state, who sat down in rooms like this one in capitalist countries and negotiated with capitalist imperialists for all kinds of trade deals, import deals, export deals, financing, insurance, those kinds of things that typically we think of in capitalist contexts, right? Who are these people? What what did they tell themselves about what they were doing and how that related to the socialist revolution? What did they tell their family members? How did this, how do they fit this into their, their own context and their minds? On the slide, we can sort of see here part of, that's one of the figures in particular, that's a man named Xin Bangli, who was the founder of China Resources, essentially, which is a multi-billion dollar SOE to this day that's still in operation. But this is someone who was vital to this early trade story uh, who really hasn't been or hadn't been discussed or um, brought into the historical light in the English language up until I, I started working on this project. So those are some of the early questions that really interested me was who was behind this trade and how did they understand their work? But the more I dug into it, a bigger question that I, I became really interested in is the, the reconciliation. So you have two two trajectories really in Chinese foreign trade and diplomacy during the Mao years that don't seem to be headed in the same direction, right? On the one hand, we've got this deepening socialist revolution in Mao's China, wave after wave of campaign uh, to reshape China in so many different ways. But at the same time that this revolution is coming into bloom inside China, you also have this capitalist trade agenda where China is wading deeper and deeper in different ways into capitalist markets around the world, right? So how do those things fit together. Uh, and in more kind of a more concrete, tangible way as uh, this woman on the right, this is from an ad on the slide from 1958. So this is during the Great Leap Forward. And she's clearly not a poster child for uh, working in the fields to boost agricultural production or steel. She's very much a bourgeois character, right? So the question is, how does she fit uh, into this larger story and, and the way that we think about China in the world during the Mao era. So before I get into that reconciliation process, I want to talk a little bit about that, how, you, how those two trajectories fit together over time and, and what the mechanics of that process were. I want to spend just a second talking about why this trade occurred 
in the first place. Right? So you get asked that quite a bit. And the short answer, like all historians, my answer to that is it, there's a lot of different answers. It's a very long answer, a long-winded answer. So I'm just going to put a couple of key reasons, rationales that motivated this trade with capitalists over time, despite what was happening inside China. First one is pretty straightforward. It's the most obvious one, geography and costs, right? So in some cases, it was just cost effective to import steel from Japan, for example, and export iron because the shipping costs made sense, right? Despite the political difficulties. So sometimes it was just a pure nuts and bolts financial consideration, right? Technology was another big part of that, uh, particularly after 1960, right? So the Soviet Union and Mao's China followed. They go their separate paths, we'll say, in 1960 publicly. Uh, there's fraying in the relationship before that. But when China was looking abroad for the technology that it needed to help modernize its economy, it did turn frequently to capitalist countries, even before that 1960s Sino-Soviet split. So, for example, during the Civil War, looking for the kinds of things like um, wireless radio equipment, they would turn, Chinese trade officials would turn to uh, capitalist countries, wherever they could find things. During the Korean War, penicillin, bandages, things like that. The party would look wherever it could to get access to these different technologies and goods, right? Food crisis is another one. That's a very specific one, right? So the Great Leap Forward from 1958 to 1962 is a very complicated situation. Uh, I won't go into details, but the long and short is massive campaign to boost production doesn't work right. There are many problems. A famine ensues. And to help alleviate the starvation afterwards, South China turns to capitalist grain exporters, in particular Canada and Australia, right, to feed millions of starving Chinese people. This was framed as a temporary measure, but it actually persisted well beyond the crisis years as well. So that was a reason for turning to capitalist markets. Um, ISI, which many of you are familiar with, in import substitution industrialization, the idea was this was temporary. China's going to import factories and technology and equipment just briefly from the Soviet Union, but also from capitalist countries, so it could build its own capital stock, its own capital base, and then make its own industrial goods and shut down that trade, so it's supposed to be temporary. That was a driving rationale. The last three bullets on the slide are about political uh, objectives behind the trade, right? So dividing the imperialists. After the Korean War and throughout the first two decades plus of Mao's China's founding, uh, there was an embargo or a series of embargoes that were designed to push China out of international trade in many respects, at least on the capitalist side of the equation. And so Beijing and China's talented trade negotiators and diplomats worked very hard to make inroads into various markets, particularly in Western Europe, but also in Japan, is an effort to pull U.S. allies away from the United States, to divide up the capitalist imperialist camp, to create tensions by offering access to the China market. It's a very political objective, which uh, is a trend that continues well after the Mao years, in fact. Gaining stature is another one, right? So China, during the 50s and 60s, because of this embargo that I just mentioned, was very effective in its public diplomacy at framing its own approach, its own approach to trade as more inclusive than American trade, right? So contrary to the Americans who are bent on excluding China from international trade, China is pushing for a global inclusive trade without embargo. So it offered an alternative approach to international trade that should sound familiar today as well to some of the themes you hear in, in rhetoric uh, in Beijing about the nature of global trade and inclusion. Last one on this is uh, showcasing socialist modernity too. So trade was very useful for the regime in Beijing to show how much Mao's China had accomplished too, right? Especially by the early 1960s, when China starts to export things like radios, and bicycles, uh, machine tools, and things that showed that China, Mao's China, had changed fundamentally. That it was no longer, it moved up the value chain. It was no longer exporting just soybeans and hog bristles and agricultural goods. It's now producing and exporting sophisticated goods to the rest of the world. So it bolstered the legitimacy of the party itself, right? So lots of reasons for this trade to continue, but one or two points of really uh, persistent consistency throughout all of this that I think these two convictions remain relevant even today 
that guided all of the trade that occurred over the years, despite the shifting rationales. One is that trade always served politics, right? There's always a political component to every trade deal. And it was essential that all of these deals be considered from that angle to understand how a certain project, a certain deal or transaction related to broader political objectives, right? So trade always served politics. The second conviction, which is related to the first, was that was the danger of unchecked markets, right? That if you didn't monitor these transactions and you didn't pay attention to how these transactions related to political objectives, they could swamp the political objectives, right? And by extension, they could undermine the socialist revolution and they could challenge or undermine party control as well, right? So given those two convictions, by the way, that second one really came not just from the, Len the party's Leninist outlooks, right? Which, which kind of viewed international trade with capitalists as inherently exploitative. It was also based on China's own direct, very concrete experience with trade during the first half of the 20th, or late 19th century up to the to the 1940s, right? So this is based on, on daily life and experiences of what imperialism and capitalism looked like in the Chinese context. Uh, so the, given those concerns, those two consistent convictions, the big question that the party faced, and I think is still a relevant question to this day, is how can China tap into these global markets for these various reasons without running the risk of losing control, without losing uh, the political authority at home that the party believes that it needs, and also kind of the, the, the ability and the authority to direct China's future course, right? That's the fundamental question that the party was facing and continues to face this day. So I started out by saying I was interested in individuals, right? And that was guiding the project. And much of the book is about the people's lives who, who conducted this trade. But over time, despite my best interests, I came to realize that institutions were critically important to this story, absolutely essential to understanding how this trade pers persisted, but also how that reconciliation process worked as well, right? Remember the reconciliation between socialist revolution at home, deeper global capitalist trade abroad, how those two things fit together. A lot of that was worked out inside of institutions, right? That's the Ministry of Foreign Trade. It's kind of a grainy photo, but that's the best one I can find. Uh, the Ministry of Foreign Trade was essential to this process uh, because it had numerous subsidiary offices within it, many of which were specifically tasked with understanding and analyzing markets in the capitalist world so that they could support China's trade agenda, right? For all of the reasons that I mentioned in the previous slide. And so because of that, these different offices and the Ministry of Foreign Trade itself had its own uh, metrics, like all good institutions do, that help to guide institutional behavior and to justify their existence, right? So if your job is to monitor the West German economy and look for opportunities to boost trade with the West Germans, then you have a vested institutional interest in making sure that happens and that you look for opportunities to make that happen, right? Year after year. That process occurred within the Ministry of Foreign Trade. As it did though, officials in the Ministry of Foreign Trade had to figure out not just how to boost trade with these various capitalist markets, but also how they were going to explain it in the terms of the revolution, right? And how they were gonna explain it in the context of each succeeding political campaign. So what happens is that over time, these officials, very talented officials in the Ministry of Foreign Trade in many cases, were tasked uh, unbeknownst to them with reconciling those two different trajectories and stress testing the arguments that they come up with to connect this trade agenda with the revolution at home over time, right? Okay, as a result of that, so year after year, justifying these trade relationships, pushing to expand these trade relationships, the upshot is that this trade with capitalists became expected and accepted politically. Right? It certainly required constant upkeep, but over the years, the logic of sanctioned trade with capitalists became baked into the revolutionary rationales, revolutionary discourse, and the outlooks that, that officials, Chinese officials, diplomats, and trade officials um, used to guide their behavior, which shaped the way that they interacted with the world. Right. <clears throat> 
one of the reasons why I think that's so important is pretty straightforward, which is that it shows, at least it showed to me at the time, and, and I think this is news to many people as well, is it shows that there are much more diverse traditions within Mao era foreign policy than perhaps we think, right? That there are actually many different strands uh, at work inside Chinese Communist Party foreign policy that are easily kind of washed over when we're only looking at the main kind of elite level foreign policy that and, and war and security and high diplomacy that tends to preoccupy us when we think about Mao's China and the world. And trade helps to bring that into focus, I think. This slide, by the way, before I forget, on the left, that is a Ministry of Foreign Trade uh, Mao badge from the Cultural Revolution, which can be had for 50 kwai on um, Kung Fuza to this day. Now, it's important to remember, though, that this process of reconciliation, so I stand back decades later, and I can argue that this was, a, this was over time um, a process of reconciliation, which sounds pleasant and harmonious, but it was, I think, anything but for the people who actually experienced it, right? And this is something that's important to remember, uh, how violent and how unsteady and uneven this process was, and that this reconciliation process hurt many people because it was not smooth, right? Mm -hmm. The lived experience of Chinese trade diplomacy was quite difficult, right? And that's because of the sensitivity of the work that you're doing, right? Every day, day in and day out, you're meeting with people who are suspect, politically suspect. They're imperialists, they're capitalists. You live in environments that are suspect. You're living many times, people were, many uh, trade officials were posted overseas within Chinese embassies. And they lived in environments that exposed them to bourgeois capitalist thinking on a daily basis, right? And so this meant that you're in an awkward and potentially dangerous position, right? Uh, which made it very difficult to do your job. What made it even more difficult beyond that is that the ground could shift from underneath you, right? So a transaction that you made one day tomorrow could be seen in a completely different light if the political winds had changed. So you're never, never on sure footing, never know for sure uh, that the deal that you're making or the hand that you're shaking or the meeting that you're taking is going to be uh, accepted in the future, right? That was the case. So this gentleman on the left here, that's Ye Zhuang, who is China's first minister of foreign trade, right? He played a huge role in getting uh, China's Ministry of Foreign Trade off the ground in the early 1950s and expanding China's trade uh, around the world. He's an example of one of the casualties. So he had a successful, enormously successful career for the first two decades until or decade and a half until the Cultural Revolution. Right? That's when many of these leading figures uh, ran into trouble, right? He ran into trouble because of his, his contacts, his networks and the suspicion of the fact that he had been uh, closely working with so many capitalists for so many years, right? Uh, the earlier photo of Qin Bangli, the earlier slide, he also ran into trouble. Neither of these men survived past the late 1960s because of the trouble that they ran into, right? This is because of many reasons, obviously, the nature of their work though, and their ties to foreign capitalists and imperialists um, was what put them in the spotlights at the end of the day. What makes, this is, this is the, I think of how to put this, one of the reasons why as a historian, one of the reasons that I like to stress in the book, and I think is really important to remember too, and I, I kind of alluded to this before about the ground shifting from underneath you, is how uncertain this process was for the people who lived through it, right? So we know most of us know the rough chronology of modern Chinese history. We know that Mao's China is followed by opening and reform, which is followed by kind of other adjustments at WTO. So we kind of understand the rough arc and now there's questions about the Xi Jinping era and where China is headed in terms of its global trade and global its foreign policy agenda, right? But we know the rough outlines and the arc of that story. It's really important, even though it seems very simple, I think it's really important to, to remember that these people did not know that, right? That the trade was a much more fluid situation for them. And so it's very easy, I think, to underappreciate just how difficult it was 
for foreign trade personnel to deal with the tensions and the anxieties because the outcome of the revolution wasn't yet clear. And it wasn't clear what would happen once Mao passed away, uh, where the revolution was heading as well. And so that's a kind of an underappreciated element that shows how difficult the work was for these trade officials. Um, and it's hard to it's hard to suspend our knowledge of the end of the story to appreciate that, but it's worth doing, I think, if you want to understand the the experience as they lived it. All right. Um, last few minutes that I have here, I want to talk a little bit about legacies and possibilities and then get into the contemporary implications. One of the things that I have to stress, and this, this goes back to what I was saying before about the uncertainty of the future. Uh, one of the most important things to stress is that this, none of this trade, my argument is not that years and years of trade with capitalists led inevitably to reform and opening, right? That's a reductionist, simplistic argument. Many, many other things had to occur in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s to shape the international environment, the domestic environment, all sorts of contingencies that made reform and opening uh, become what it did. My argument is that the institutions and the rationales and justifications and the personal experiences of those Mao years and the process, unsteady and sometimes violent, of reconciling, all of that made it possible. They were critical components in laying the groundwork for reform and opening to occur. Right? It's an important difference. One of the people, this is Chen Yun uh, on the slide here, he was one of the people that I think illustrates that point because he lived through all of it, right? His career spanned from the 1930s in terms of trade all the way up through into the dung years, right? And this is a picture of him in the 60s, but in the 70s, he's an interesting character because he is someone who, based in part on his experiences watching China trade with capitalist countries, of watching the risks, assessing the benefits, He's someone that by 1963, in June 1963, when he's chatting with a, with a colleague in Beijing, he reflects to himself that China needs to know more, needs to do more in terms of its engagement with the capitalist world. It needs to understand capitalism more, that that's the future. And it, what he says is that China is going to achieve the role that it should have in the world. It has to understand capitalism better. So it has to wade deeper into it, essentially. Right. And he makes this point, too. He says that in the early years, China traded 75 percent with the Soviet Union and the socialist allies and 25 percent with the capitalist world. So in the early PRC, by this time, it's the reverse. 75 percent with the capitalist world, 25 percent the socialist world. And this is in the early 1970s. And then he sort of asks rhetorically, do we think this is a fixed ratio? Is it ever going to go back? And he says, no, this is this is the path forward. And I think that's based in large part on his own experiences, watching what could be done, what could be achieved, and also understanding how the world was changing. Um, and we can talk in the Q&A about how the world was changing that helped also to reinforce some of these lessons and make uh, make this a, a clearer choice for Deng and for Chen Yun and for Li Xianyan and other top Chinese officials. Temporary connections. So like I said, there are many, many I think important reasons for understanding this Mao era trade and diplomacy, if you want to understand Chinese trade today, these are just two very straightforward, most explicit examples. You're looking at two screen captures from the last couple of years. These are from major Chinese media outlets. These are from People's Daily, right? And there are two expressions here, both of which are Mao era slogans that remain ubiquitous in Chinese trade diplomacy today, right? So on the left, you see the last four characters on the bottom right, is Pingdeng Huli, which is equality and mutual benefit. That's something that stretches back to the 1950s is a fundamental principle that Chinese trade officials would stress again and again and again and again in their uh, transactions with capitalists, right? Given the way that they saw the inherent exploitative nation, nature of capitalist trade. The more important one, though, I think is the one on the right. So last four characters on the right there is Zili Gongsheng. Uh, and not the last four, sorry. The Zili Gongsheng Zhilu. So the... How do I say this? So last in the last six, it's the left four. Um, but anyway, this is a slogan that goes back even further, right? And this is often translated today in contemporary press as um, 
autonomy, I think is how it's usually, or, uh, or what's that autarky? Yeah, usually autarky, which is not what it means. Self-reliance, I see that sometimes is, is, is kind of the shorthand translation, which is a little bit better, I think, but it really, it means sort of revival or reconstruction through one's own efforts, right? But the meaning of it is really important. It's never meant autarky. It's never meant shutting down China's trade relations with capitalists. It's never been the idea as far back as it's existed. It means being aware of the vulnerabilities that come from this trade and not letting those vulnerabilities get too great, right? So being strategic about economic engagement. And if you don't know the history of that slogan, then you run the risk today of misunderstanding this. These are quotes from Xi Jinping. So this is Xi Jinping invoking these terms. You misunderstand what he's trying to say. Right. It can look like this is a push for autarky, which we see sometimes in popular press. That's an overly simplistic notion that can be obscured if you're not really attuned to some of these historical phrases and, and what and the layers of meaning that come with them. All right. 30 minutes ish. Well, yeah. there we go. Bye. Yeah, the end was the house, the important housekeeping stuff, which is for people online. Uh, please type your questions into the box at the bottom of your screen and they'll be combined and possibly read later. I see now from our agenda that I get 10 minutes of cross-examination before we talk oh, okay. to everybody else. But I don't think I'll need that. I just have a couple of questions. Um, one question was prompted by my experience with my first teaching job a long time ago at the University of South Carolina, which prided itself for having the number one, two, or three international business school. Mm -hmm. I asked one of the professors there how it could possibly be that the University of South Carolina was better than Harvard and the other uh, kind of places, and he said, well, that's simple. Harvard doesn't recognize international business. There's just business. There's no international advertising. There's advertising. There's not international accounting. There's accounting and, and so on. So that naturally led me to the question why you have capitalist trade as opposed to just trade, including um, in your index. Why, where is this term coming from? Why are you uh, choosing to, to um, reify it, make something of it the, uh, the way that you are. Is it coming from them or you? And I have a, a second question about latecomers and what is particularly distinctive about China here, except for all the hand wringing yeah. about, oh, we don't really want to enable our enemies by trading with them and giving them money somehow and helping them exploit their worker workers and all that stuff. And so in other words, except for except for a little bit of hand wringing, what exactly is different in the Chinese case than any other latecomer to industrial capitalism, mm -hmm. such as India or Vietnam or any other place that you could uh, come up with? Yeah, both good questions. So on the first one on the terminology and what makes this capitalist trade. That's a great question. And I've been asked that before as well. This is in the book. And I do, there's this footnote. Maybe it should not be a footnote. It probably should be in the main text, but it's not, it's, it's their term, not mine. And it's a bit of a lazy term. I think, you know, one of the interesting things about looking at the primary sources is that there's not much investigation into that line between socialists and capitalists. It seemed to be, you know, it's, in the accounting terms, it's it's a stark division between the two, right? So in that sense, I'm relying on that distinction as the Chinese trade officials saw it. And so capitalist trade is trade with capitalists. Um, now, obviously, there's a lot, it, 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 despite the fact that there's not much reflection in the primary sources about the distinction between the two and what constitute capitalist trade, constitutes capitalist trade versus socialist trade, there are instances where you can see Chinese leaders, key officials grappling with this question. And there's a, one of my favorite examples is Zhou Enlai, who in the 1950s, um, there's a behind the scenes conversation about uh, cotton exports. And there's some hand wringing among senior officials because um, Joe wants to know: Are we dumping here? Is this price dumping? Because we're flooding the cotton. We have massive cotton exports, and the price of cotton is going down. And Indian officials are complaining because that's an important market for India, and this is creating all kinds of political problems. So, our, you know, what's going on here is what Joe wants to know: Is this price dumping? And he asks underlings this. And they say, not really, no, it's not. It's because uh, because price dumping would be conceived in their terms as a capitalist kind of ex exploitative, exploitative export agenda, right? Um, and the officials say, well, 
not really. We're just dealing with some major issues. We've got a bumper crop and we can't help it. What goes on with, you know, the international crop is doing quite well. So we're just exporting like everyone else. There's nothing that's different about it. And Joe sort of cuts him off and says, this is dumping. This isn't socialist, essentially. This isn't what we do. We need to fix this, which shows that there is an awareness that the equality and mutual benefit elements for some of these top officials was something that distinguished Chinese trade from uh, capitalist trade, socialist trade from capitalist trade. But that's obviously not consistent because there are also many, many examples too of Chinese practices during this time that look massively exploitative in terms of in a real deal capitalist sense. So, and that. In that way, it is um, it is more complicated. I am reproducing their distinctions. And I don't, I, it's a shorthand to show who the trade is being conducted with rather than to characterize the nature of the trade itself. So excuse me, what, what is the Chinese name for it? Chinese term? For capitalist trade? Yes. There is isn't one. It's but the part. But you said that you came from, from the, from them. So what do they call it? Trade. With capitalists. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, the, in terms of, so it's not, it's not, um, it's not capitalist trade. It's the who the trade is with is how it's characterized, right? So, it's just Mao's Mao is how it's described almost uniformly. And then Maui with respect to a particular trade partner. Does that make sense? Yeah, so I have not come across, I, at least not to my, my mind, I don't believe I've come across a specific instance of someone parsing the two in the original the primary sources that say this is Shobidri Wadada or Shobidri Mali. Do you find a lot of examples of when they turn down an economic opportunity in the name of socialism? In other words, you said one of their core convictions is trade over uh, trade is subordinate to politics. Yeah. Um, and every case that I've kind of looked at in a similar kind of period, when push came to shove, the the the, the imperative to accumulate to make money uh, won out. Um, were there were there examples that you found? I mean, consistently found where they're saying we we would really like to make this giant pile of money or import this latest wonderful bit of technology, but but we're not going to do it. Would go against our political ideology, and therefore politics yeah. is in command, not yeah. not uh, money. The most obvious example is the Joe example right. that I thought of, but that's not a very satisfying example because it doesn't mean that the Ministry of Foreign Trade went out and canceled all their contracts and said, like, well, Joe said, we're not going to exploit, we're going to price dump, so we'll stop. I'd be very interested whether they talked about the Soviet Union having done to them in the previous decade exactly what they're doing on others, namely dumping cotton on yeah. China. Yeah. The Bulaji fad of the late yeah. 50s, yep. is, you know, I've read yep. it entirely caused by the Soviets demanding that the Chinese take yeah. take their, so maybe they're saying, well, a good, maybe they're split anyway. This is how you do it. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, this is how you yeah. do it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, I've had my 10 minutes or more. Uh, wait. I have a comment and a question because I look at the same set of, uh, you know, things that you have presented. And and I was still not arrived at the conclusion that, that in this kind of capitalist play, the labor origins for China's capitalist uh, I mean, market lives. I mean, the reason I'm saying this is, is this. You can see what's going on here is a, it's a case of the psychologists call it the cognitive dissonance. In this case, it's ideological institutional dissonance. Now, China wants to play it, okay? but they sometimes have to face a capitalist economy that institutionally, ideologically, was at odds with what they are practicing at home, right? So in some ways, they have to engage in this play, but also try to resolve this dissonant sort of ideological and institutional sort of, you know, things happening at home. The way they do that is try to keep this around and just, you know, within a small group of people, elites, Right? Don't let this all these capitalist practices in abroad to, to, to disseminate to the general public. The other thing is just to try to invent a vocabulary, try to justify what is going on. Right. So in other words, it's precisely for the purpose of keeping China on a socialist path that they 
faced with the reality that they have to trade to get what they want. They invented all this vocabulary. Mm -hmm. In other words, this vocabulary is the stumbling block to China's sort of later market reform and capitalist you know, rise. I mean, they are, they are, if they were not there, China probably would have gone the other way uh, easy. So, so okay, so I, what I'm trying to say here is that, that I mean, China had these kind of practices in, in the past, during the war period. You have Baichu and Hongshu, the common control area. They have a trade and get salt from the Baichu, the Wuomindang control area. They, they do this. I mean, pragmatic. They needed these things. And even during the reform, I remember one of the cases that I looked at, you know, Nan Jiechun, you know, in, in, which is a, they were practicing this commune style socialist village in the sea of market reform. So they invented a term, which I think characterizes well what you're describing. They said, we you know, means internally we practice communism and everybody in the commune will be still doing what Mao did in, in the 1970s. But way, yes, that is, we got to be a pragmatic. We have to adjust to this, all these changes happening around us, which is market is becoming more and more important. So they did that for, for quite a number of years. They, they, and to the, to the leftists in China, they were, they were seen at one point as an example of how you can still practice uh, socialism under the form. Mm -hmm. right? The same thing going on here, that they, they faced with this kind of ideological institutional dissonance, they had to invent a different vocabulary, try to capture what's going on. Mm -hmm. But it was this kind of vocabulary that maybe you see traces of that in Xi Jinping's slogans and communist propaganda. But it was precisely these things that are blocking China from a full-fledged market. That's what I make my comment. Those are great, great points. Um, and so two things in response to that, because I think they're, I think, we're on the same page in some respects, in some pages, in some respects, we're not actually. So in terms of um, the vocabulary being a hindrance, perhaps if we're thinking of the end goal being full-fledged market embrace and, and capitalism in China. But the way that I see it is that terminology was absolutely essential in facilitating the transition from the Mao era to the post-Mao era. And you can see Deng time and again invoking these Maoist principles to justify policies and expand the scope of some of these concepts in ways that were way beyond what Mao had envisioned. So in that sense, these terms were flexible enough to work both ways. They're, you could see them as inhibiting this transition toward full-on capitalism, or you could see them as playing an essential role in expanding the scope of this trade in the post-Mao era into reform and opening it into the 80s and 90s, which is what I see happening. And the best example of that is Deng continually pointing, saying, look, Mao, he says specifically, Mao said this. Silly Gong Zhong, this is a Maoist principle. We're gonna, we're gonna build on that and we're gonna continue with this Maoist line, which reinforces party legitimacy and gives it the foundation that it needs to remain relevant, despite the fact <laughs> that inside China, it doesn't look like Mao's China anymore. Right. And so the, the best way to explain that is to, to highlight, which is Dung is very shrewd at this, Chen Yun too, highlighting the connection of the Maoist principles to justify this continuity, even though it's questionable how much, I mean, there is continuity, but it's being stretched beyond all recognition for people who are living through this transition. Right. The second thing that's interesting is that it goes back to your point about kind of sequestering this behavior so that people don't see it. Um, in some respects, that's true. In others, it's the opposite. So, for example, in terms of the political propaganda, the public diplomacy, every time China, there's a great example in, in April of 1952, there's a Moscow International Economic Conference that was held as this socialist alternative uh, of inclusive trade in contrast to the embargoes that are targeting the Soviet Union and the socialist world in China as well. This conference was all about touting inclusive trade. And, and of tons and tons of left-leaning uh, business people were invited to the conference, and many of them signed deals. Many of the deals didn't actually come to fruition, but they signed deals, and there was tons of propaganda about it. All of this was, was championed back home as successes, right? So in that sense, the party was underlining this inclusive trade as, as a success and as a different way to conduct 
non-exploitative, mutually beneficial trade with capitalists, sensible capitalists, uh, in pursuit of socialist revolution in the Chinese context, right? So in some certain ways, the party really bent over backwards to highlight these successes because of the political message that it sent, right? And this goes back to your question too about the different, like what is capitalist trade and what is socialist trade? In those, in that public diplomacy effort, it's not really picked apart in a deep, meaningful way. It's just inclusive trade. It's meant to stand in contrast to the exclusionary policies of the capitalist world, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I mean, to some extent, I agree with you. But what I, what I'm uh, doubting is the core argument that that the message that. That um, that the China's capitalist rise, you know, had these origins in these set of discursive and institutional practices that the Communist Party had mm -hmm. under Mao. I'm not entirely convinced. I see all these as a as a case of 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 China, you know, trying to resolve this kind of. Uh, this dissonance, mm -hmm. and and they they have to invent a set of practices and, and discourses to justify, rationalize, and until now, but now, for example, in within China, you, you have these two discourses. One is comparative advantage. We create because you know for each for our own self benefit, uh, for our you know we because there's a positive sum to be gained through this comparative advantage, right? Um, but there's another discourse is about, you know, trade on basis of equality, mm -hmm. and, you know, all this, which I has some sort of resonance with the Maoist past. So to the extent, you know, that the Communist Party leadership could not get over that discourse, that's an impediment. Mm -hmm. That's that's what I'm trying to say. That that that, that rather than rather than its origin. I mean, these two things were fundamentally incompatible. There are, these are two institutional incompatibilities that they try to resolve without changing their own system. I think I'm going to intervene and in let make sure we get other questions because you have just had ten minutes of crossing. Good point. Good You can come to dinner afterwards and continue. I'm at. Yeah, I actually think I can tie this to what you said at the beginning about your focus on figures and the people who yeah. did this. And you mentioned the term practices. So trade is certainly about um, terminology and policies, but it's also a set of practices that officials learn how to do and um, relationships that they build. And is it the case that it's the same people from the 70s to the 80s that they're building on things that they learn about the how to deal with the outside world? Um, yeah, it is. It is. In many cases. I mean, Chen Yun's a good example of that. Li Xian Yen's another example of, of some of the old timers who have been around. And so they, they did stick around through reforming. They did. They did. So yep. Learning. And not only that, not, I mean, that's a very good question. They did stick around. Not only that, but many of them, not many of them, some of them rose to the very top, like Chen Yun did. And so this kind of goes back to the origin point uh, and whether that's a fair claim to make. Um, they, the party, certainly there are many other factors that shaped reform and opening and outside examples in East Asia and Southeast Asia, right, that helped shape the way the party was thinking about its options in the 1970s, uh, when it was clear that a world socialist market was probably not going to happen anytime soon, right? Um, this, this experience, my argument would be that this experience and the ideas and the practices and the stress testing that occurred over these years made the decision easier to make, to, to open up more and to embrace some of these outside models in ways that perhaps they would not have had they been starting from scratch. So in that sense, the personal continuity was important because they'd seen that you could scale up and back depending on the, on, on the international context and the domestic context in order to pursue China's broader social aim, socialist aims. Harry? Yeah, um, I was curious about the genesis, some of the images that were on there and the advertising copy itself, like we are talking about cognitive dissonance. Yeah. Did the makers of these kinds of ads for foreign, you know, capitalist economies where they're making, you know, to me, ad copy seems inherently quite capitalistic yeah. to be writing up, or do they just see it as 
showing the world the glory of what China's socialist state to produce? How do they sort of think about creating this kind of ad copy, these kind of images? Yeah, so, I mean, well, you've written more yes. on Chinese advertising <laughs> than, than anybody around, I think. Um, those images, these are for foreign export audiences yes. only, right? So these are English language, yes. Spanish language, well, it's foreign trade, the People's Republic of China, which was, um, you know, a glossy export magazine in English um, that... Um, what I one of the reasons I find probably you do as well that I find them so fascinating is because they're so deliberately bourgeois, yeah. right? They're so yeah. the amount of makeup on the woman having dinner with the sherry glasses is astounding, right? It's very clear that this is a sort of kind of a caricature, uh, but it but a genuine too one too, right? That's what makes it so interesting is that it's a it's designed to be sufficiently attractive to actually boost exports of mauling fish, braised yeah. fish with onions, right? So to do that, you know, this is the party drawing from its internal resources. So in some ways, it shows a desire to be a part of these markets, but it also shows just how limited this engagement was because they kind of missed the mark in some in some ways, right? Is that so? That, I mean, that's, yeah. Yeah. Good for you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Great. Uh, Russ, thank you so much for your vivid and interesting explanation of your of your work. I'm curious about the research process itself. Um, was it, what kind of documents did you come across to actually locate the people behind the data that you were looking for? And was it difficult to access those? Did you feel like you were able to answer all of your questions? In that Definitely not all of your questions. That's a very good question. Historians always love document sources questions. So if you're very, if there's a silent lull and it's awkward and the historian's presenting, ask about the students and that'll get <laughs> fired up. And it will with me too. So I, I love that question. Um, the answer to the last question about whether I got everything I wanted, absolutely not. You know, what I would love to do is sit down and interview that woman in the ad and ask her, you know, what was going on? How did this, how did you see this connecting to the broader socialist objectives of China in 1958, right? And just to get a fuller sense of what that was for her. That's not, that wasn't available. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I relied a lot on internal party documents that are not, no longer available. I conducted the research in a different time when things were a bit more accessible. There are actually a lot of good memoirs as well from written by people who participated in a lot of these trade operations and organizations that um, that can be quite insightful. And there are enough of them too that in some cases you can cross check them to make sure because there tends to be um, some exaggeration. And sometimes these memoirs, the arcs of these memoirs have sort of familiar, <laughs> uh, there's a familiarity there that makes you a little bit skeptical. Um, so, but there's enough to put together a coherent narrative and to scratch the itch that I had for understanding these lives. But, you know, in some ways it's scratching the surface. There's so much more um, that that is not available. In fact, there is a new archive, I believe, a China Resources archive that opened up in the last couple of years. It's not open to all China Resources is the 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 SOE that started out as a front company in Hong Kong that I had the picture of the founder of. Um, so there is an archive, there's tons of materials, but now it's not really open for research. It's more kind of a showpiece for, for the company than anything else. But one of these days, maybe. Over there. Uh, yeah. Over there. Thank you, Professor Kelly. And I'm curious about, I mean, when China uh, start to change its policy and turns into a reform and opening in 1978. And I'm curious about, did Western countries expect that? And what's their attitudes like uh, the government or economists or other expertise? And what's your attitude? Uh, they surprise or just don't believe it, or they think uh, they are finally have chances to you know trade with this uh, mysterious country. Yeah. So you mean what was the what were the expectations of, of non Chinese yeah, trade yeah. partners at the in the seventies? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Before right. reform and opening. Uh, or at the time, when uh, China's government uh, claimed this policy, uh, and what's the Western's attitudes? Yeah, you know it's interesting. I mean, there's a long history of of foreign traders being excited about pro the China market and the, the allure of the China market, and you see that fairly consistently in um, in the archival documents as well. 
way before the 1970s, right? So this wave after wave after wave after that, that's what made it so effective for Chinese trade officials to kind of dangle market access or dangle long-term deals um, in order to kind of pull apart solidarity uh, among Western allies, Western allies, Western Europe and, and the United States. Um, so in the 70s, I think on the outside, you know, I don't, I have not come across fantastic predictions that said this is it, you know, this is the real, this is a real change. Um, it probably felt to them at the time that this was more of the same, which was kind of a, an eternal optimism, but also one that had a dose of cynicism, if you can have the two at the same time, right? Where an expectation, you would be astounded to think that things maybe took a different direction and that this wasn't the blossoming that we thought. Because you see in the Mao era too, there were ebbs and flows, right? So for example, in the early 1960s, there were a lot of really big deals where China signed um, China signed deals to bring entire plants from West Germany and from Britain uh, into China. And that looked like a real pivot as well, but that was on the eve of the Cold War Revolution. So some of these projects got started in the early 1960s, 64, 65, and then fell apart in 66, 67, because the Cultural Revolution occurred. So to them, in the minds of people in the late 1970s, there's no reason to expect that not to recur again, right? Does that answer your question? Yeah. That's a good question. Thank you. I think we have time for one last quick question. Okay, this is quick. Um, I'm just curious about how you decided to end your research, what the ending point was. And um, I believe you said the early 70s. So I'm curious, was the decision not to include the reform in the opening era like, intentional to challenge this kind of simplified periodization? Yes, I'm glad you asked that because I forgot to mention that very point. First, well, I will say the research is never over. It's never over. I can't, I'm done with the book and I moved on to other projects, but I, there's still so much more. I still have questions. So I still have kind of side projects that came out of it that I'm working on. But um, the reason it ends in 1973 is because that's when China embraces this what's called the 4-3 program, which is this massive import program worth 4.3 billion US dollars from various capitalist countries all around the world, including the United States, right? And so it's this massively ambitious program to change the scope and scale of China's trade relationship with the capitalist world in 1973. The reason that's so important is because it's important, but also because, like you said, it's five years before 1978, right? So it is deliberately an effort to kind of muddy the line a little bit or blur the line a little bit to show that we thought maybe you've accepted that dividing line uh, too too readily. So that's why I ended 1973. Also, because that's when Chen Yun has this conversation, this realization too of like, I think this is it. I think this is the direction we're headed. Carl, can I just put in a little advertisement? I, I'm going to put, I, I've been instructed to put an advertisement for no, the next talk at the no, Soviet no, Leo. No, there's something else. Okay. Something related to <laughs> which is two advertisements. Then. You know, this is about, you know, you asked a question about data, archives, and stuff. And can, as China, the access to historical archives especially becomes more difficult. So we actually uh, try to. Uh, help our students and faculty to gain access to different types of data, including digital data. But in, in this case, that Fudan University, there's a professor called Zhang Le Tian, you know, who has collected all kinds of archival data from the, uh, basically the, uh, uh, a lot of the state enterprises that kind of disappeared. They have personnel files there, whatever. So he collected a lot of them. He's making them available. We are willing to invite him maybe to give a talk here. To, he's willing to allow some access to those data for students. I assume a lot of these your students in history, in PRC history, that would be a treasure house of, of you know, archival documents and data that you can use to study ordinary life in, in mm -hmm. under Mao's China, as well as economic and political alive from China. So this is just, you know, to keep, you know, reading things coming from the 21CC email, and, and hopefully you'll uh, come to that if we end up organizing that kind of a symposium or talk live television. Right. Well, one more advertisement then. Before I close, I want to announce the next uh, lecture in this series. Next Thursday, we have Zoe Liu from the Council on Foreign Relations to discuss her new book, Sovereign Funds, how the Chinese Communist Party 
finances its global ambitions. Hope to see you there. Thank you until next time.